Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Nall. I'd like to welcome you to our special edition today. We like to present information every day of the year, holiday or not. Today, we're going to look at why you should be eating more mushrooms, especially if you want to help prevent decline in your memory and cognition, so says the National University of Singapore. We also have Dr. Peter Bregan talking about what's wrong with mental illness diagnosis and treatment and psychiatric processes in general. We'll have back Dr. Peter Gochi talking about the over-medication of everybody in the world. So we have a lot to share, plus a special commentary from uh, Chris Hedges and Truth Dig on what's, what's wrong with this whole impeachment process. But we begin always with the latest on health and healing. And I believe people should be eating mushrooms. Um, oyster mushrooms are terrific, very tasty. And uh, white mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms. But I want to start with something people are not aware of. Having owned three very successful vegan restaurants, in fact, the first gourmet vegan restaurant in America, the Fertile Earth, up on 108th and Broadway, I'd be interested to know if any of you ever ate there. From 1970 till 19, almost uh, 1980, we were there, and I, I didn't do it for profit. In fact, I, I actually subsidized it because one day I was looking at a, a student uh, who was there, and he, he had ordered a meal. And then when I prepared the meal and gave it to him, he said, well, I didn't realize what it cost. Can I have half that? And I said, no, eat it all. I said, are, are you... Limited? He's yeah, I'm very limited. He says, people are under this impression all of us at Columbia are rich or have rich parents, and that's not true. At least half of us or more come from working class backgrounds, and it's very expensive. And uh, he said, so we have to watch our budget. I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. And I, I thought about it. I said, you tell everyone at Columbia, no exceptions, that they can have a full gourmet organic meal here, vegan meal, for $2.50. He said, really? $2.50 for a whole meal? I said, that in salad, soup, entree, and dessert. Four items. And he was very happy about that. Well, the next day, wow. The doors opened at 4 o'clock, and we had a crowd. And we were open until 10 o'clock at night, and we had to extend our hours to 11. Every seat was packed. And I asked my brother Stephen, I asked my brother Howard to come in, uh, friends, Neil Kramer, Ron Milky, we were all working because it was so busy. But I had a limited menu. I only had two entrees, two salads, two soups, two desserts, people to select from. And it was it was rough. Fortunately, I had a good landlord, and he didn't charge me much rent, so we all donated our time. And uh, But a lot of people had good food. And one of the items that we ate a lot of there because I grew them upstate. I had the Fertile Earth Farm, which was the first organic teaching farm in New York State's history. There was only two organic teaching farms, Rodell, down in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, huge complex, very well done. I had a lot of respect for Robert Rodell. He's the one who did it. And mine, which was smaller, much smaller, it was 50 acres upstate in Stone Ridge, but about 15,000 of the listeners of my radio audience attended weekend workshops about Everything about soil, growing, organic, um, and humane animal husbandry, meaning you don't kill the animal. You love it, and you find it a home for life. So I had the first animal sanctuary up there. And so we'd raise the food, grow, grow the sprouts, make the Essene breads, the French brick, brick ovens. Uh, we would do everything up there and then bring it down early in the morning, every day, seven days a week. So people didn't get fresher food than that. and uh, But mushrooms also are easy to grow. And we would grow a lot of mushrooms. Now, the proper way of dealing with mushrooms is that you put them in and you put a, 
um, a non-toxic natural cleanser in there. There's one called Veggie Wash, which is very good. Or you can make your own with some hydrogen peroxide. And the key is that you're getting rid of any bacterial, viral, parasitic debris that's on the mushroom. And then what you do, and the key is this, you rinse them and then you press them with your hands until they're absolutely flat. Now, ideally at that point, you dehydrate them. You can put them in an oven at low temperature and they dehydrate down and they dry out. Now you have something that's very easy to work with and in the kitchen, that's what you need. You take the stems off because they're too pithy. Uh, they're just pure fiber. And you then use your different, like Miriam sauce and and uh, gluten-free tahini and different seasonings, and then you saute them quickly, generally about three minutes, and they're, they rehydrate, they're delicious, and you can dice them and put them into a miso soup. You can put them into brown rice. You can bake potato and stuff them in there with some sauteed garlic, onions. But mushrooms in a regular restaurant even in a gourmet restaurant, they simply brush them off. Okay, so let's just use the same, when you go to the bathroom, you just kind of brush off the debris that uh, you just evacuated from your body without washing it. Are you clean? No. Nor is the mushroom that they're preparing. Well, the assumption is that the heat from whatever they're using to you know, whatever medium they're cooking the mushroom, that'll destroy everything else. That's not true. That's not how you destroy parasites. A lot of bacteria live at the bottom of volcanoes. So forget the, you know, 400 degrees that you're cooking something at. They can survive at 4,000 degrees or they can survive in the Arctic. In fact, there's all forms of viruses and bacteria like the anthrax was recently discovered in reindeer that had thawed in the Alaskan tundra and suddenly it was infectious again. So proper hygiene is one of the single most important things you can do. In fact, yesterday I was in getting some organic produce and I, I was watching this right beside, I was looking at some grapes and the woman was opening the grapes and having some from several bags. And I said, I said, you are aware of how many hands touch that grape before you eat it. And she turned to me, and she says, I don't care. Okay, I didn't say anything. But if you only knew how many hands touch your food before you get it, you'd be more conscious of washing it thoroughly. In any case, let's get back to the mushroom. So a new study from the National University of Singapore showed that if you have mushrooms on a regular basis in your diet, it could significantly reduce your chance of losing your brain function as you age. Now, they're talking about 300 grams. Now, it's 28.35 grams to an ounce, so you're talking about 3 ounces uh, to 100 grams. Uh, so you're talking about around 9 ounces. That's a cup or maybe a half a plate of mushrooms every week. And uh, that could be 50% less likely that you would end up uh, having decline in brain function as you age. So why? Because they're strongly anti-inflammatory. And there is a, uh, what is known as the ergotheanine. It's uh, responsible for these remarkable results in the mushrooms. Plus, depending upon the mushrooms, there's anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, and antibacterial effects as well. All good. Also, uh, from the health area, there's there is a benefit from, and this is according to the Journal of General Internal Medicine, uh, from those, and I deal with a lot of uh, vets who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's a separate set of protocols I've created, but pain is a big deal because so many vets come back from the theaters of war with all kinds of pains. And in fact, 140,000 army soldiers alone reporting with chronic pain following their deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan in just a, uh, a relatively short period of time. So chronic pain in the joints, because think of the food they get over there. And these are all 
uh, food packages that are you would never eat. You would never touch them. And yeah, once a year when the president or secretary of defense goes to Afghanistan, you'll see them all having turkeys and, you know, the traditional garbage diet. What you don't see is what they eat on a daily basis. And how many of these army bases just have junk food? You know, the, the pizzas, fried chicken, nuggets, etc. This can cause massive inflammation. And that leads to chronic pain, especially in the back, the neck tissues, and muscles and bones. Then that leads into taking stronger and stronger pain medications. And that means frequently they come out of there on opiates. And that can mean they can die. Opiates kill, big time. So then the question is, what can you do if you don't want that? Well, here are some suggestions to overcome pain. First and foremost, I would recommend acupuncture. Then I would recommend biofeedback, chiropractic care, therapeutic massage, and exercise therapy, and cold laser therapy, osteopathic spinal manipulation, electrical nerve stimulation, ultrasound, a superficial heat treatment, traction, and lumbar support. And in fact, the ultrasonographic therapy is a technique that uses echoes of ultrasound pulses to pinpoint objects or areas of different density in the body. And these are all non-toxic and they work. So that's important. Now, dietarily, get off all the soft drinks, coffee, alcohol, and then the fried foods, the dairy and the meat, and go to a healthy plant-based diet and have lots of green juices, that can reduce the inflammation and heal. Use oils internally like olive oil and coconut oil, flaxseed oil, avocados and avocado a day helps keep heart disease and pain away. Uh, Raw onions, sweet onions are good. Garlic is good. Cat's claw is terrific. Cayenne is terrific, as is, uh, as is curcumin. So you see, for all those hundreds of thousands of people in the military, as well as the general public, if you're suffering from chronic pain, those are just a few suggestions. Also, um, we now have a new study from reported Natural Blaze about how reading books compared to reading from screens. Here are the facts. Numerous studies show the scientific benefits of reading. Now, these benefits tend to increase when reading from actual books rather than off screens. And the question then is, do screens consume the majority of your time? When was the last time you read a book? Reading is akin to exercising for your brain. So what is the takeaway message here? In the age of information, we're being bombarded left, right, and center with quick facts, fake news, censored information, biased information, propagandizing information, video images, and much more. There is greatly affecting our attention span, all of this, and to many the idea of picking up a book when we could just be listening to something or reading short segments off our cell phone then the idea of reading a book is completely absurd. However, there are many benefits that come along with reading books that just might make it worthwhile to you. Consider just the very act of reading a book in itself, holding it, turning the pages, seeing your progress and the development of the story. It's almost as if you are a part of the book. Reading requires patience and diligence and discipline which is not something required from a glance and a click on a quick headline. Reading a book is almost akin to running a marathon for your brain. I mean if you can finish the whole book. Reading stimulates imagination and creativity. Research has shown that reading helps with comprehension and emotional intelligence, as well as fluid intelligence, meaning your ability to reason and have flexible thinking. This, in turn, leads to smarter decision-making regarding yourself and others. So as we age, our memory will decline. But if we age healthily, it'll decline minimally. 
but regular reading can help keep minds sharper longer, according to research published in Neurology, the peer review journal. Now, frequently exercising your mind can also help us uh, study to lower our mental decline by as much as 30% or more. That's big. That's important. And also, reading can help make you more empathetic. Researchers from the Netherlands designed two experiments showing that people who were emotionally transported by the work of fiction experience boosts in empathy. And that's important. Aside from these deeper reasons to read books, I would also suggest that books are an easier way to help your eyes than video screens with blue, blue light, which will provide a nice break for many of us as we are spending an increasing amount of time staring at screens at work and home and on our smartphones. And so just some good old-fashioned reasons, buy a book. Also from Hazung University in China comes a study about people who take long naps during the day or sleep nine or more hours at night have an increased risk of stroke. This was published in Neurology. That's the Journal of the American Academy of Neurology. So I suggest you take not a 90-minute nap, but rather a 30-minute naps. You don't need a nap lasting longer than 30 minutes, okay? And that'll help you. And also, uh, from one final study here, six in 10 Americans this year said that they wanted to get into shape and at the beginning of the year, they're going to. But then they don't. And they fall back into old habits. Instead of going into a gym, they threw in the towel. So people are giving up on exercising at a young age. And that's not good because they're so addicted to spending all their time sitting in a chair, sedentary, lack of heart, lack of circulation, lack of healthy habits, and that's not cool. So let's encourage the young people in our lives to get out and to do some exercise. Power walking is probably the easiest and best exercise overall, but ideally you should loosen up, get into it, get your heart going slowly until that's about five to 10 minutes, then get into a full power walk as fast as you can for another 45 minutes and cool down for five minutes. You've done an hour work and it's been terrific for your health. All right? Please go to prn.fm and download the latest two articles. One is on the environment, a real different type of article on the environment, what realistically we can expect, and at least 40% of the article deals with positive solutions that you individually and small groups of people can engage in without waiting to the government. doesn't seem like they're going to do anything, so you don't have to feel frustrated. And also read the one on walking away from Wikipedia and why we have been lied to by Wikipedia when it comes to giving us fair, objective, and, un un uh, and unbiased information on any form of alternative health. This tells the truth about Wikipedia. And share it with everyone you can. Now, we're going to hear from Dr. Peter Bragan. He has a background in neurology and psychiatry. And this is the story the mainstream media dare not tell. But we're here with it. Listen now to Dr. Bregan. This is Dr. Peter Bregan, and this is another in my simple truths about psychiatry. And the subject today is that psychiatric drugs are much, much more dangerous than you've ever, ever been led to believe by the doctors who are prescribing them. I genuinely believe that if most people knew how dangerous the psychiatric drugs really were, most people would never start on them. And I also believe that if most prescribers had even the faintest idea how dangerous they were, they'd stop prescribing them. Well, how is it that so many people can be ignorant about psychiatric drugs? Well, the truth is because they're all getting their information from the drug companies. I mean, when was the last time you saw a car company leap up to tell people way in advance that they'd had some deaths on the road from their bad brakes? 
when was the last time a car companies went mea culpa and said, yes, uh, our accelerators are sticking and running people down? Well, I can tell you the drug companies are even worse. They go to all kinds of extremes to avoid letting you know and letting your doctor know how dangerous the drugs are. I know this because I've been a medical expert in dozens of lawsuits against drug companies. I've looked inside drug companies and seen what they're really doing. I was appointed by a court in Indiana to be the scientific expert for over 150 lawsuits against Eli Lilly, suits alleging that the drug Prozac had caused violence, suicide, mayhem, mania, and psychosis. So I know what goes inside I know as much as anyone about how dangerous the drugs are. So let me just give you a little brief outline of material you can find in the first half of my book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. Obviously, the second half is intended to help you come off psychiatric drugs because it can be very dangerous to come off drugs. It's dangerous and sometimes more than starting the drugs. Let's take a look at the stimulants that you may be taking as a college student or as a parent that you may be giving to your children. Follow-up studies on people who were started on stimulants as children show that they have shrinkage of brain tissue, measurable on brain scans. They have reduced height and weight. They're being incarcerated more often than other people. They're going to mental hospitals more often. Their suicide rate has increased. Every single one of these facts documented by follow-up studies of what happens to you if you get started on stimulants. And one particularly well-done study, the rate of cocaine abuse is greater when you become a young person man or woman if you've been put on stimulants as a child. That's because the stimulant drugs such as uh, Ritalin and Concerta and Adderall and Dexedrine, uh, they're so similar to cocaine in their effects. All right, let's look at another group, the sedative sleeping pills that you're taking like Sonata and Ambien, any one of the prescription sedatives used for sleep. We now got two or more good studies showing they shorten lifespan. You can Google them. You can Google practically anything I'm telling you, but you'll get more accurate and direct data from psychiatric drug withdrawal. Now, what about the benzodiazepines, the tranquilizers like Xanax and Valium and Ativan and Clonopin? They're very addictive. You know that people taking Xanax in control clinical trials after a mere six weeks, a large percentage can't get off after a mere six weeks. They become addicts to Xanax. Great for the drug business. Great for your psychiatrist or prescriber who just wants to write prescriptions. Terrible for you. These drugs now, several studies show, like Xanax and Ativan, they're causing shrinkage of the brain too. Coming off them can be an absolute horror story. It can be harder to get off those drugs than to get off opiates. They leave people who try to come off of them with horrendous insomnia, horrendous anxiety, aches and pains in their body, such pain in their feet that they can't stand up, that it's just too much pain, weird feelings throughout their body, and then... The realization as they come off that their minds aren't working as well, that they have memory loss for the past and have more trouble learning. Now, I know this is hard. You know, it's hard for me to even talk about it, but it's really time to face up to just how dangerous these drugs are. So we've looked at the stimulants and the sleeping pills and the benzos. Now the antipsychotic drugs, which are not really antipsychotic drugs, they're just lobotomizing drugs that are being given to some people for sleep, like Seroquel is being given to people for sleep, and, and Abilify and Latuda and uh, um, Rispadol and Zyprexa, all of these drugs, all of these drugs are very damaging to the brain. They, they virtually wreck a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, they cause a dreadful disorder, tardive dyskinesia. I've done a whole simple truth 
video about tardive dyskinesia. They're shortening the lifespan. We have evidence that people who are put on a lifetime dose of these antipsychotic drugs for whatever reason, whether it's to help you sleep at night or because that you're hallucinating and have a lot of problems, 20 years shortened lifespan. And we know some of the ways the lifespan is being shortened, because especially these newer antipsychotics, so-called second generation or atypical antipsychotics, they're even worse than the older ones in causing a metabolic syndrome. People get obese, they get diabetes, they get pancreatitis, they get elevated uh, cholesterol, blood pressure is off. And then, since the drugs also cause heart arrhythmias and in combination with other drugs do even more cardiovascular damage, that's one of the ways in which people are having shortened lifespan on these drugs. The mood stabilizers, so-called, which are just flattening, emotionally flattening drugs. Most of them were originally anti-seizure drugs. The one we've studied for the longest time is lithium. If you stay on lithium for a lifetime, like your doctor tells you to, you're at grave risk of severe mental problems in the form of memory difficulties, learning new materials, conducting your affairs like you have your whole life. None of these drugs are good for your brain. All of these drugs are bad for your brain. And it shouldn't be any surprise. These drugs are producing multiple biochemical imbalances in brains that don't have any biochemical imbalance until a physician or prescriber puts you on the drug. Now, please, don't just stop taking your drugs because the ultimate tragedy is that Coming off of them can be catastrophic. People can get suicidal. They can get violent. Some of the drugs, you can get seizures. Some of the drugs can drop your blood pressure if you're coming off. So, you know, get good information. I put everything I know about it in psychiatric drug withdrawal. Get good information. Get some good clinical supervision. Work with your family or friends. The shorter time you're on psychiatric drugs almost certainly means that you'll have a better quality of life. We're just going to go from Dr. Peter Bregan that you just heard right into Dr. Peter Goetze. If you remember, yesterday I played a short segment, but now I'm coupling what Dr. Bregan had to say with Dr. Goetze's uh, insights on mental health and how it's been misdiagnosed and mistreated, over-pathologized, and over-drugged. And this will take us up to the end of the program. The scientific one is, does force do more good than harm? I believe clearly no. And antipsychotics cause vastly more harm than good. Ethics, is force ethically acceptable? No. Antipsychotics kill a lot of people and cripple many more. Legal issues, international declarations are being ignored. I'll come back to that. So we must change our laws because they are unjust. <coughs> now, first of all, do these drugs work? They are not specific as the name implies. Anti is a misnomer. Antimicrobial agents can cure us from infections. Antipsychotics don't cure anybody. It's, it's a misnomer. And the placebo-controlled trials are highly flawed because they are not adequately blinded. These drugs have many side effects, so most doctors and patients will know whether they get active or placebo, and then the effects will be exaggerated. And then there is the cold turkey phenomenon in the placebo group, that in virtually all trials, you take people who are already in treatment, and then you have a short washout period of typically up to a week, and then you randomize to placebo or another antipsychotic drug. That means that you create abstinent symptoms in the placebo group in quite some patients. So you introduce harm in the placebo group. And then you conclude that my new drug is better than if I harm the control group patients. That's not good science. It's appallingly poor science, but that's how Virtually all psychiatric drug trials are being done. Despite these heavy flaws, 
the effect of antipsychotics in recent submissions to the FDA is actually so small that it's doubtful it's clinically relevant. It's only six points on the positive and negative syndrome scale for schizophrenia, and psychiatrists have established that the minimally clinically relevant change, which means what you can barely perceive that now there is a change to the better, for the better or the worse, that's 15 points. So the Food and Drug Administration have approved olanzapine, risperidone, and drugs like that, despite the fact that the effect they have in deeply flawed trials, so this is exaggerated, is below what you can barely perceive as a change. So that tells a lot about these drugs. And then the schizophrenia diagnosis can be wrong in over 50% of the cases. So you, you, should, you subject people to forced treatment with very toxic drugs, and they don't even have an indication for treatment because it's wrong. That's another sign that we are not doing well here. The cold turkey design is clearly lethal. One in every 145 patients who entered the trials for risperidone, olanzapine, ketiapine, and sertindole, they died. And these deaths are unknown to the public. They don't appear in published trials reports, and the FDA didn't require them to be mentioned. That's pretty typical for the FDA. This is an agency that by and large protect the drug industry and not the patients. And we are not much better in Europe with our European medicines agency. Now let's look at the first of these drugs. Antipsychotics are really psychiatrists poster child. And the first one was chlorpromazine that was launched in 1954. And in the beginning, the psychiatrists were sober because they called it a chemical lobotomy, because it worked like lobotomy. People became quiet, uh, apathic, or a chemical straitjacket. These drugs have no specific antipsychotic properties. They calm down people, and they lessen psychotic thoughts, but they lessen all thoughts. So it's difficult to exist when you take antipsychotics. One year later already, the hype was extreme. It was forgotten that this is a chemical lobotomy, and Harold Himwich, the president of the US Society of Biological Psychiatry, came up with a totally absurd idea that antipsychotics work like insulin for diabetes. It was purely fantasy. If you need insulin, and you get insulin, that's a remarkable treatment. You give people something that they have too little of. This is curative. People with psychosis don't need anything. Uh, they are not short of anything. And then psychiatrists like to say that these drugs emptied the asylums. Miraculous effects, that's certainly not true. The asylums were emptied for economic considerations, both in the United States in the United Kingdom, everywhere where it has been studied, it had nothing to do with the effect of antipsychotics. So this is part of the folklore in psychiatry. There are so many myths and lies in psychiatry. Um, it's pretty astonishing for me, who is a specialist in internal medicine. I never heard of any specialty where there are so many lies as, as in psychiatry. It's very strange. Now, there was an early double-blind trial where the National Institute of Mental Health investigators, and they had not been blinded effectively because these drugs have side effects. They saw the exact opposite of what is actually true when you medicate people with these drugs. Because what they reported was reduced apathy. It's the opposite. Improved motor movement, not at all. Less indifference, totally wrong. So this tells you a lot of how unreliable trials in psychiatry are, that psychiatrists very often see or report what they would like to see. This is a psychological phenomenon. Um, 
And they have failed to live up to their professional responsibility by neglecting to perform head-to-head -head trials between benzodiazepines and antipsychotics. When I lecture for patients or previous patients and ask them, if you should get admitted next time with a psychosis, what would you prefer, a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic? Every one of them so far has said a benzodiazepine. Then why do we treat, when, treat them with drugs that are among the most toxic drugs ever invented apart from chemotherapy? It's not right. Now, in 1989, 35 years after chlorpromazine came on the market, the only two trials had compared the two types of drugs, and they produced similar improvements. Why hadn't loads of these trials been done? Because the drug industry controls everything, and the new drugs were very expensive, the old ones were cheap, so there was no incentive in showing that the old drugs were equally good or, or perhaps even better. So these trials were not done, but the psychiatrists could have done them. They didn't. There are now more trials, and there is a Cochrane review of 14 trials that showed that sedation occurred significantly more often on benzodiazepines. These trials are not very good, but the best evidence we have tells us that benzodiazepines are probably better. This is incredible. In, in my country, sometimes psychiatrists use benzodiazepines in acutely admitted patients with psychosis. But our guidelines say the same as in the rest of the world, that they should use antipsychotics. Now, since these trials are so flawed, can we trust meta-analysis of many trials in Cochrane reviews, for example? No. By and large, we cannot. There is a huge Cochrane review of uh, chlorpromazine, 55 trials, 5,500 patients. And now look here. The abstract says that akathisia did not occur more often in the chlorpromazine group than placebo. There was no reservation. Uh, for this statement. Now, akathisia is this extreme form of restlessness where some people say, I want to jump out of my skin. It means I can't sit still. They pace around frantically, perhaps, and this predisposes to both suicide and homicide. It's a horrible condition. How can it be that these drugs cause akathisia and the largest trial that contributed data actually found significantly less akathisia on drug than on placebo, almost half as much on drug. That can't be true because antipsychotics cause akathisia. Placebo cannot cause akathisia. So what did we see in these trials? A cold turkey in the placebo group. The placebo group was harmed so much that you couldn't see how dangerous these drugs were. So this result speaks volumes about how flawed trials in schizophrenia are. And uh, some Cochrane researchers, they realized this. So they wanted to study people with schizophrenia who had never been treated with antipsychotics before. How can you find such people? They virtually don't exist. So they went for first episode schizophrenia, where no one had been treated before to avoid this bias. But they found so little, so that what they ended up with was a review of studies where a majority had first episode schizophrenia. They even included second episode schizophrenia, so they were likely already treated. And if the majority had first and second episode, then there must be some who had a third episode or fourth episode schizophrenia. So these trials were still flawed, but what they found was the available evidence does not support a conclusion that antipsychotic treatment in an acute early episode of schizophrenia is effective. Isn't it incredible how difficult researchers can be? Why don't they just say they didn't work? That's what it means. And the next sentence is even more difficult. 
The use of antipsychotic medications for millions of people with an early episode appears based on the evidence for those with multiple previous episodes. In plain, en in plain English, these trials are crap and we don't know what we are doing. <laughs> Um, so, we treat these patients with drugs that I believe they would fare better without receiving. But then, how long should we treat them? Many of them are treated for years or for the rest of their lives, unfortunately. But some studies have been made where after successful treatment, you then try to stop the treatment to see if it's still necessary. And of course, you will have cold turkey symptoms if you stop treatment suddenly. That's pretty horrible. So these trials are also flawed. And you have them overall everywhere. In psychiatry, you have them in depression. So you introduce cold turkey in the placebo group and then you say, oh yes, they still need the treatment. That's not good science. But here is a very rare good paper. Here, the researchers, after they, after they had remitted, then the researchers randomized the patients to either reduce the dose or discontinue it <coughs> completely, or just to continue with the dose maintenance for two years. And after two years, the doctor could decide the treatment. So, what happened after two years? Well, more had relapsed when they lowered the dose or stopped the dose than if they continued. But the recovery was the main outcome. Who got well? Well, after seven years, more people had recovered when they had their dose reduced or stopped, 40% versus 18%. And the dose in the last two years was 64% higher in the maintenance group and stopped drug completely at seven years. 11 had stopped during this period of time in uh, the, the uh, dose reduction group versus six. So they got less drug and they fared clearly better. We have other evidence that supports this, that the less you use of antipsychotics, the more likely it is that your patient comes back to life and get a work and get on with life. So these antipsychotics, they create chronic patients. That's what they do. And how do we find out if they kill people? Some leading psychiatrists uh, say that antipsychotics actually help people survive. That's pretty far-fetched. Such toxic drugs, how can they help people survive? And then they built their view on very bad research. If we use the randomized trials in schizophrenia to find out if these drugs are lethal, then it's flawed because we have deaths in the placebo group because of cold turkey. So we can't use the schizophrenia trials. So I went to the elderly with Alzheimer and dementia, where these trials had been tried, because I thought, well, then likely a good deal of these people were not in treatment before, so there was no cold turkey in the placebo group. So what did that show? Well, for every 100 people treated for a few weeks, there was one additional death on drug compared to placebo. So, this is damning evidence that we kill a lot of people with these drugs, and, and that was only throughout some weeks. And um, considering the huge weight loss that many people acquire, and they develop diabetes and heart problems and so on, it's very difficult to imagine that these drugs save lives. They don't, they kill a lot of people. And they do a lot else. They cripple people. They lead to irreversible brain damage that can start pretty quickly. And in a dose-related fashion, the longer and the higher doses, the worse. And 
few people get back to normal life compared to if you hadn't treated them with drugs. You become dependent on virtually all psychiatric drugs, so you, become, you get, can get abstinence symptoms if you stop suddenly. And you can get psychosis even if you are still on the drugs because you change the brain in such a way that you can get what is called a supersensitivity psychosis. And that's typical for many other psychiatric drugs that they can actually create the diseases they were supposed to work for or even worse diseases. So they are really double-edged swords that doc doctors have extreme difficulty handling. They, actually, they can't. So let's go back to the essays. Is force ethically defensible? No. A few hours or days of disturbed behavior are treated as a cause for a lifetime sentence to a drug treatment. And psychiatrists in training will hardly ever see a patient who is not already snowed under with drugs and therefore get a wrong impression both of the patient and his strengths and the potential for cure without drugs. So typically when patients uh, have strange movements and ticks and, and you, you know, uh, salivates and so on, these are drug effects. But many people believe this belongs to schizophrenia. That's a disease effect. It's not. Some psychiatrists feel they cannot live without forced treatment. Most of them feel that. But they should think about that the patients cannot live with it. They actually die from it. That's far worse. And only soldiers at war and psychiatric patients are forced to run risk against their will that might kill or cripple them. But soldiers have chosen to become soldiers. Psychiatric patients have not chosen to become psychiatric patients. So this is deeply unethical. And as we all know, power corrupts. And the power imbalance in psychiatry is extreme. So there is a high risk that forced treatment is being used to benefit the staff rather than patients in order to make their work less stressful. We know that this happens a lot. And I have estimated antipsychotics have killed hundreds of thousands of people and have crippled tens of millions. It's really gigantic. Some patients who were killed have begged what they call their torturers not to get the drugs. And very few have been investigated for slow metabolism, which can increase the risk of death. Quite many people have different metabolism from average, slow, in, in, intermediate, or fast. Here is a heartbreaking story of a Danish girl written by her mother, how psychiatry killed her daughter at age 32 after her 14-year career in psychiatry. She was a slow metabolizer. Her mother begged the psychiatrist to have a test done, which he refused. When Louise's best friend suddenly dropped dead on the floor at the hospital in Denmark, Louise said, I'll be next. She was killed six months later. At one point during all that, she asked her mother, Mother, do you think it's better in heaven? It is so cruel. And very few will believe in forced treatment after having read this book. You will have tears streaming down your chin if you read this book. So I can recommend this for you. Um, <clears throat> the diagnosis was wrong. She didn't have schizophrenia. She had Asperger. The psychiatrist didn't listen, not even to their own staff who knew Louisa much better than they did. And they declared that she was seriously ill and should have even more drugs when the staff said she's doing fine. They consistently blamed Louisa and her mother for everything. It was never the precious pills, and certainly not themselves, that were at fault. This is quite typical as well. And they increased the dose when it should have been decreased or stopped altogether. Louisa didn't tolerate the drugs, and she was aware that they would likely kill her. Post-mortem, the system congratulated itself for its first-class homicide. 
Louisa had received the highest standard of specialist treatment. That's what we say when we kill patient, people in psychiatry in Denmark. Cause of death unknown. The officially accepted term for such death is natural death. How natural is it that a 32-year-old girl suddenly dropped dead? We know that psychiatric hospital contact is pretty fatal. We know that from a large Danish re register study of two and a half thousand suicides. The closer the contact with psychiatric staff, which often involves forced treatment, the worse the outcome. The suicide risk is 44 times higher for people admitted to a psychiatric hospital compared to those who don't receive psychiatric treatment. And, and then you will, of course, think, isn't that natural? Those who are most ill get admitted to hospital and they kill themselves. That's not because of a bad environment at the hospital, but actually, most of the potential biases in this study favored the null hypothesis of there being no such relationship. So this study is pretty strong. And there was an editorial that said it's entirely plausible that the stigma and trauma inherent in psychiatric treatment, particularly if involuntary, might cause suicide. People in my country are still told, not always, but sometimes, schizophrenia is a chronic lifelong disease and you need to be drugged lifelong. And then they leave hospital and have no hope. Is it strange that some people kill themselves at this point when they also suffer from horrible side effects? I don't think so. And schizophrenia is not a chronic progressing disease. People can get cured from schizophrenia. So now we come to Alaska because the Alaska Supreme Court has decided that the government cannot drug someone against their will without first proving by clear and convincing evidence that it is in the best interest of the patients and there is no less intrusive alternative available. I have told you about benzodiazepines. That's less intrusive. There is always less intrusive alternatives available. And, and Jim Gostein, himself a previous patient, used scientific evidence to con convince the judges. In another case, the court decided that if the alternative is feasible, the state has either to provide it or let the person go. Jim has also uh, noted that psychiatrists with a full understanding of the trial judges regularly lie in court to obtain involuntary commitment and forced medication or orders. I got that experience yesterday. The petitions I saw were full of lies. It was unbelievable. We can discuss that later. Now, the legal issues are, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, that is about prohibition of torture. No one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And we have a committee for the prevention of torture that travels around and visits psychiatric institutions and write reports with criticism. And they say that patients are often restrained, usually mechanically, in belts as a sanction for perceived misbehavior or as a means to bring about a change in behavior. That's not allowed. And uh, where physical restraint is necessary, it should in principle be limited to manual control that you fix the patient like this. Talking to the patient or calm him or her down is the preferred technique. And Peter Bregin from New York in particular has shown how effective this can be. Well, that's our program for today. I want to thank all of you who took your time today. Hope you have a wonderful day. Look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow.